We are living in a computer programmed reality and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed and some alteration in our reality occurs. We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present deja vu, perhaps in precisely the same way, hearing the same words, saying the same words. I submit that these impressions are valid and significant. And I will even say this, such an impression is a clue that at some past time point, a variable was changed reprogrammed as it were, and that because of this, an alternative world branched off. another edition of Free Association Radio. This is your host, Robert Phoenix. And guess what? It's Monday. And when it's Monday, we do the Monday mashup, which we haven't done in about a month at least. I took some time off for the holidays, and and I've been in Boulder shooting the 11th house with Guy MTV, which, by the way, if you've not checked out, I urge you to sign up for Guy not just because I am on it, although that is partially the reason, but there's a great deal of information <clears throat> that's available to you. Let me just show you a little bit how it works. I was in uh, Boulder on Monday, and uh, I was talking with Jay Widener, and Jay had told me about Dane Wigginton, and he told me that Dane was the guy. He was the geoengineering guy, and that he had he had it all laid out. When I heard that from Jay, I was like, wow, okay, well, I've got to get this guy on my show. And the reason why Jay brought him up is because he was going to be on Regina Meredith's Open Minds series. So I found out about Dane through Jay and Gaia, and I had him on the show. And Dane is going to be on with Regina Meredith. So there is a great synergy that's taking place here. And if you enjoy the material that you hear, on my programs, you'll enjoy what you see on Gaia because it's that and more. And I can't, I can't, uh, I can't speak for it enough. And quite frankly, I'll be honest, I wouldn't really have known that much about Gaia if Jay weren't there and if I wasn't a part of it. But now that I am, but I, I can see where um, they are really putting themselves out in front in terms of this type of information that we all need to know about. And, and quite frankly, a lot of it is not really all that happy and positive, although there are things on Gaia that can help you balance your life out, I suppose. There's a lot of yoga videos. There's Trudy Styler videos. Trudy Styler is Sting's wife. Apparently, she's quite the yoga person. The crypto She does crypto-terrestrial yoga. I'm all stuffed up. Can you hear that? Man, I'm under attack. I am being attacked. I am being targeted. I am being targeted by cedar trees. Cedar pollen in Austin makes living here difficult. And it is a, about a two-month stretch. Let me, let, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to whine just a little bit, if you don't mind. From January through the end of February, <clears throat> the cedar trees are mating. They're spreading their yellow dust everywhere. It's on my car. 
you, you throw that into the chemtrail mix, and you've got a really interesting atmospheric cocktail. So I've, I've managed to avoid getting sick. I've managed to avoid the chemtrail flu. But the rear armament of the cedar trees have taken me down. And as a result, I'm taking lots of pseudoephedrine. And I can't always be held accountable for my actions on pseudoephedrine. I hate to say this, but it's true. So the cedar trees are killing me here. Now, they'll go for two months, beginning of the year to the end of February. And people say eat local honey. I've tried that. I don't think it really works. Maybe it works for some people. It's not working for me. So we have this for two months. And then uh, that will take us out to March. So for March, April, May, those are, those are three quality months of nice weather without the cedar pollen. And in June, it becomes a terrarium, a hothouse here. June, July, August, September, four months of some of the hottest weather and humidity that you can imagine. So we've got the four months in the summertime and then the two months of the cedar pollen. That leaves October, November, December, three months, and then the three months of spring. Fall and spring, good news here. Summer and winter, not so much. But who's complaining? I'm alive. I have two legs. I have two arms. I have a relatively normal respiratory system. And what more can I say? I have a great kid, lots of great friends, wonderful internet community, people that listen to the show. Speaking of which, big shout out, a big love to Barb Santora, who is having a very difficult time as her mother makes the transition. And I know that she's been getting a lot of support from people, uh, both locally and through the internet. And um, wishing you, Barb, nothing but grace and peace and the realization that the door is opening in your mother's life and in your life as well. There's something very profound and very special and timeless uh, about death. I'm not, I'm not romanticizing it. Sometimes death can be an incredibly tragic experience in our lives. Many people spend a great deal of their lives trying to rebound from. There's no return to baseline once somebody special or important or close to you leaves. Is it, I've, I've done the study on it. I've looked at the statistics around grieving and mourning, and they're <clears throat> very interesting, to be honest with you. There's no general consensus about how people recover from death. It's very different for different people. Some people never recover from it. Some people do quite well. They're able to grieve and have some kind of relationship with their experience in the afterlife. Those are people generally that have some kind of religious faith. It's easier to do, I think. Whether or not it's just a belief or a crutch, that's up for the individual to decide and understand and experience. But nonetheless, it is a, it is a profound Profound. It is a. It's a cliche to call it a profound experience, but it is. And you never really quite know how it's going to impact you until it happens. You can have some. You can project yourself out to a certain degree and experience it to a certain degree. I didn't know how my father's passing was going to affect me, and then all of a sudden, it just started to happen. He got sick, and he continued to get sick and get worse. And, of course, the medical system enabled that, that uh, worsening. The medical system helped debilitate him even further. This I'm convinced of. And I've talked with other people who were part of the same medical system that he was. I've talked about this before in the show. This is nothing new. But at the end of the day, it was, uh, 
his passing moved me in ways that I could not ever fully imagine. And I'll, and I'll, I'll say this, and I'll say this uh, because perhaps this might help somebody out there somewhere, that my father's passing was actually quite liberating for me. And I love him, and I loved him dearly, and we had a very complex relationship. But when he left, it, there was a, a, a space that I had never experienced before. And um, what was also really interesting about that is it coincided with sort of the, the um, activity I was putting on the website and doing the blog and starting to do radio. It was sort of like one part of my life ended and another part of it began, really. And it was with his passing. So, Barb, if you're listening, God bless you. I wish you nothing but um, peace and love and support and healing and grace. And to also know that there is the potential for your own personal transformation and liberation around what you're experiencing. Now, that segues us into one of the things I wanted to talk about today, which is Obamacare. Speaking of death and being managed out, Obamacare uh, is a nightmare, and we're only just beginning to get in touch with it. By the way, if you want to find out more about Obamacare, I urge you to go uh, track down Katie Galanti's interview with JP yesterday. Uh, check that out. It's quite good, and you'll find out more about Obamacare than you probably would like to know. So go find that interview. Uh, there is, there are, pardon me, there are a number of clauses in Obamacare that are quite ugly. They're very ugly. Obamacare is a tax. It is medical fascism. It is the net, the social net that is been cast to scoop us all up in one form or another, either economically or medically. One of the things in Obamacare that people don't know about is that let's say you go to a medical practitioner, a doctor. Doctors, by the way, are up in arms about Obamacare. They do not like it. Most don't like it. So let's play the game. You go to Obamacare. You go to a doctor through your provider, which you have signed up for through Obamacare. And you go to that doctor and you say, doctor, I have bronchitis. Or I think I have bronchitis. And the doctor does an uh, examination. And he says, well, you know, you do have bronchitis. And then what he does, he has like a an iPad device in his hand, and then he will enter in a code for your diagnosis. And then that iPad will spit out exactly what is needed for your recovery. And oh, by the way, it will factor in how old you are, and it will factor in how much you get in terms of your care and recovery based on all the variables that are part of your profile. Well, let's say, for instance, you're in your 30s, your prime of life, the system has an investment in you, they want you to live as long as you can because they want to get as much tax dollars off you as possible. So they give you the best, the best care that you can get under that code. So the doctor prescribes it. Now, let's say, for instance, the doctor looks at that and and realizes that there is a new drug that has been untested that you are being given. However, he might have some information that some, that, that some of the uh, ingredients of that drug may have been linked to other drugs whose trials may have been quite disastrous, and they changed a few things around just to make sure that this drug can get through. And let's say this doctor has a conscience. And he says, well, they're recommending this drug, but you know what? I think if we prescribe Y instead of X, it'll be just as effective. Well, guess what? If he does that, he is subject to a $100,000 fine. A $100,000 fine. 
if he goes off road and decides to apply some other form of treatment or prescription. If he does it a second time, he can have his medical license revoked. Now, if you are a patient and you do the same thing and you decide not to take up with the prescription, the remediation of your bronchitis, you will also potentially be fined as well. At that point, you will have to go to the pharmacy and get that prescription. You will. If you don't, you'll have a visit. You will have a follow-up visit. You'll have somebody say, hey, how come you didn't do that? Will they, will they know if you take that drug? Probably not. But they'll know that you don't. They'll know if you hadn't bought it. This is the matrix. The Affordable Care Act is the matrix, and it's only just starting. It's only just beginning. Now, there are a number of people who are probably going to opt out of this. And the reason why is because they do not want to have their own bodies and their own medical care be mandatory. It's funny. Women can have the right to choose for their bodies. And it is an inviolate right. You tell any woman that they can't choose, and trust me, you will be shredded and eviscerated very quickly. Very quickly. However, if we as humans choose to treat ourselves and have our right to choose how we heal our own bodies, then it becomes a different story, doesn't it? It's okay to choose to remove a human life. That, that should never be questioned. But if we choose to not participate in the system, if we choose allo, uh, naturopathic or homeopathic care over allopathic care, if we choose to maintain our bodies and use acupuncture, chiropractic, and any other means besides modern medical allopathic practice, then we are in violation. We are in violation of a mandate, of a federal mandate that has been consecrated by the high gods of the Supreme Court and justice in this land. By the way, the deciding vote, John Roberts, Aquarius. I love Aquarius people. Trust me, I have Aquarius friends. But it's a, it's a, it's, we have not even come close to the enlightened version of Aquarius in our time, in our lifetime. Not even close. Lower octave Aquarius. And, of course, it would be a Supreme Court justice. Not just any. He's a chief justice, right? He is the man there to decide that vote. And thus make Obamacare a tax. That's how, it, that's, how they, that's how they define it. Obamacare is a tax, boys and girls. It's a tax. Now, if you opt out and you can't, you have to pay a fine. Well, guess what? It's a penalty. You have to pay a penalty in your taxes. I think right now it's around... 5% of what you make, it's going to go higher. It's going to go higher and higher and higher the number of people continue to not opt into Obamacare. And at which point, Obamacare will be cheaper than the fine, the penalty. This is, a, this is, a, uh, this is not a good thing. <laughs> Trust me. And it was forced down our throats. All the Democrats voted for it. They did it without even looking at the legislation, uh, at, the, at, the Obama, at the Affordable Care Act, which has been cooked up for a long time now. They've been working on this thing for the last 20 years. It's not like they just spent a couple of weekends at the Holiday Inn in uh, Bethesda and drew it up. I just lost a caller. They were just waiting there. I don't know what they wanted. Sometimes people call in and listen. There's another one calling in listening. Uh, it's a Skype line. 
This has been in the works for a long time. And the Democratic Party just rubber stamped it. They didn't even read it. Oh, it's good. It's good. Trust us. Trust us. Obama does not have to do another thing for the rest of his term. He's done. He did what he came here to do. He passed Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. They tried it with Hillary. It didn't work. That was the, that, that's how far back this goes. They had it all cooked up. They used Romney's plan for Massachusetts as the template. <clears throat> they injected it with steroids. That's what they did. And now here we are. Now, the states, I think uh, one of the states, it might be Mississippi, has decided to not play ball. States could do that. They could decide not to play ball. But I'm not sure, you know, how many, how much uh, states' rights are actually being honored these days. The state of Utah decided that they didn't want same-sex marriages to take place, and immediately Holder stepped in and said, you got to you got to the line. You got to toe the line. And once it happens at a federal level now, there is no turning back. And of course, the courts are rigged, so it's always going to happen in favor of the federal government. Whether it's corporations being people or eminent domain being recognized when the opportunity to seize land or resources occurs, of course, or genetically modified foods. Very rarely do the courts rule in favor of the Vox Populi. It's because of the makeup of the Supreme Court. So we have the Supreme Court, and they're not really doing their job. The Congress and the Senate, on both sides, horrible, horrible. You know, you know, the conservatives, they don't get a free pass just because the social progressive Marxist model is, is failing. They don't get a free pass. I mean, here we have people that are really in, living in hard times, hard, hard, hard times. Jobs are being moved out of this country. And the ones that do return, they return at 70, 60% of their former wage because some jobs are coming back. It's actually becoming too expensive for China and corporations to produce goods in China. So some of those jobs are coming back here, but the, the wages are, are suppressed. So we live in this globalist schema, and the, the job situation in this country is dire. And the conservatives' answer is to, well, let's shorten. Let's shorten the unemployment benefits. Great. Great. That's not going to help. The unemployment benefits are the only thing that are keeping a small, a, a fairly large band of people, band with the people from just completely falling off the social roles and onto the streets. That's, that's, it's the last buffer. And don't tell me that there's no money for it. There's plenty of money for it. Plenty. The progressive side is arguing that unemployment benefits are not the answer. Long-term unemployment benefits aren't the answer. What is the answer is a living wage. Now, I would tend to agree with that to a certain extent. And the only way that I would have some circumspection when it comes to this issue is that the living wage should not be a uh, a soporific when it comes to people having some kind of will or desire to make a living for themselves above and beyond what has been carved out for them so that they can just lay back and live on the dole, which is what potentially a living wage might be, potentially. 
I'm not saying that's what it would be, but potentially. These are tricky, tricky, tricky pieces here for people to navigate and deal with. Because the inequity between the ultra-haves, and I'm not talking the 1%, I'm talking about the quarter of 1%, and the rest of us is widening. It's widening on a daily basis. What the United States needs, more than anything, and I'm just talking about the United States now, more than anything, is they need to be able to have tax breaks for small companies and local investiture. Small companies need to have the playing field leveled for them to some extent so that they can employ people. Unfortunately, now small companies have to deal with Obamacare. And what do you think Obamacare is going to do? They're going to have to provide health care for all their employees. It's going to force them out of business. And who do you think uh, likes that or profits off that? It's the large companies. It's the corporations that can do it. They're having their competition wiped out. So the only thing that really could help the United States in terms of jobs is to provide tax breaks, low interest loans to small businesses, and to begin to add tariffs to, yes, international products coming into this country to return to some kind of tariff system. But it's not going to happen because the internationalists and the globalists and the corporations don't want that. They want their version of free trade, right? That's what they want. They, they don't want any kind of, of uh, anchors or any kind of, of uh, blocks or any kind of additions to their – their, their ability to do business how they see fit. But that's the only way that we can get back on track here in terms of providing jobs, tax break for small businesses, low interest loans for small businesses, and the return of tariffs. You do that within 10 years, I guarantee you, I guarantee you that this country will not be looking towards unemployment or even a universal wage. There will be enough enough healthy businesses emerging to provide employment and a natural safety net for other people. But it's not going to happen. The federal government wants to become the biggest employer on the uh, on, on this on the soil. Now and I'll tell you I'll tell you how this looks and how it's worked out. Okay. Here we go. Um, I was in Boulder, I think about a month ago, and I did a show on Pluto and Capricorn. You can go on to Guy and watch the show that I did, and I talked about Obamacare as being a manifestation of Pluto and Capricorn, which is the fusion of government and big business. That's what Pluto and Capricorn is. It is the hybridization, the mutation of the, corp of the corporatocracy, and it's where we have corporations that influence the rule of government and government that is being ruled by corporations. It's this strange mutation that's taken place since 2009. Pluto went to be Capricorn right on the heels of the government bailout. Now, the rollout of Obamacare was done by some friends of Michelle Obama. It was a no-bid contract. I forget the name of the company, but the result was a disaster. Everybody knows that it was a disaster. And what's interesting is, is that most people talk about the disaster, but they don't talk about Obamacare. You see, it's really interesting. It's like, here we go. We're going to basically serve you up a train wreck. We're going to give you a platform that is so broken that, that the only thing you're going to focus on is the platform, and you're not going to focus on what's behind the platform. You know, when I was in uh, Colorado, and I did a show off the Nova Capricorn, I said that a corporation would come in and rescue the day. They would rescue the day, and they would run Obamacare. And lo and behold, just this last week, 
it was announced that Accenture is going to take over running Obamacare. Now, who is Accenture? Accenture is a massive global company, and they run all the software and all the back end and all, all the, uh, the computer interface for agencies like the IRS. Right? So I think the IRS, uh, I think the SEC, Accenture is, they're based out of West, they're based out of Virginia, they're Fairfax, Virginia. They are the de facto partner for the United States government running their websites and all of their all of their infrastructure. Now, why didn't Accenture just get the gig from the job? If they're already doing all these other websites, and clearly there's a relationship between them and the government, and I'm sure the IRS work, website works just fine, why didn't they just do it from the start? Well, the answer, I think, is pretty self-evident. Number one, a friend of Michelle Obama's got a lot of tax dollars to get that contract. And number two, I think that they were banking on the fact that the job was above their pay grade, that there was an immediate obsolescence that would emerge, and that they could turn to a trusted partner to take over that contract. And in the meantime, we would spend all of our time and energy talking about how broken it is. It won't be broken for much longer, trust me. And at that point, at that point, the distraction that the launch of the website was, will no longer be an issue. We'll be staring at something very different as a result. All right, let's take a little break here. Let's play some music, and we'll be back, and uh, we'll get into the, uh, the final 30 minutes of the show. What do I want to play here? Oh, boy. Let's see. Um, how about – what do we want here? Nothing. Uh, how about uh, Navai Savage Bird? This is uh, Susan Dehi, my friend, the gifted and talented vocalist from Iran, Navai Savage Bird. I'll be back in five minutes and 18 seconds.
That was Susan Dehim, Navai, Savage Bird. Kind of an interesting little interlude to take you to some other destination. Uh, if you're listening to the uh, Monday Mashup, this is Robert Phoenix, and uh, we are ranting and raving today about Obamacare, or at least I did for the first half hour of the show. My 49ers won yesterday. Colin Kaepernick, Pluto conjunct Sun and Scorpio, did his thing. He's a barbarian. Colin Kaepernick is a barbarian. He's Jim, Jim Harbaugh's lead pet barbarian. Those guys, I can tell you right now, those guys have fought in wars together in other lives. Trust me. And they'll be going up to Seattle to play the Seahawks this Sunday. Battle in Seattle. Yeah, that's right. My cat is, uh, she's a Niner fan. Actually, she's upset that the Panthers lost. But that's the way it goes. Well, we know pro sports are rigged. And whoever the powers that be deem to win for whatever purpose, symbolic or otherwise, well, it happens. Generally speaking, that's the way it goes. Officiating almost always plays a hand in it. The black and white, the zebras, the stripes, the arbiters of duality who are the referees, authority on the field. They're the ones that always enter in. And somehow, somehow they determined the outcome and the reality of that contest. And I don't think it'll be any different this year. Um, I just sent out the uh, last newsletter. For those of you who are on the newsletter list, you should have gotten it. If not, check your email box. And I talk about uh, the uh, the cold polar. What do they call it? The uh, the, the polar. Uh, there's no word for it here. Hold on. There's a spe- the polar plunge. The polar vortex. Do you remember when we would just get storms and they would just be cold fronts? Do you remember that? They wouldn't have names. They wouldn't be specifically targeted as this incredible phenomena that could, you know, kill us. Put our lives in danger. Well, the last one, this polar vortex, which, of course, most of us understand and realize was manufactured or at least amped up via the steroidal manipulation through the ionosphere of HARP. But um, it was named Hercules. They started naming winter storms. Winter storm Hercules. Well, there's a movie coming out about Hercules. Is that interesting? Well, if you got the newsletter, you would see where I make some very uh, unusual connections between Hercules and the storm Hercules and the movie Hercules and even the upcoming Super Bowl where the halftime entertainment will be performed by Bruno Mars. Mars. So we have an invocation of Mars at Super Bowl 48. And if you break down the number 48, it becomes number 12, which are the 12 signs of the Zodiac and also the 12 labors of Hercules. And Hercules actually, through one of his labors, the 11th labor, I think it's the 11th labor, where he kills the daughter of Mars, Hippolyta. So we have another cold front coming in, another blast of Arctic air. It's uh, coming this week, by the way. I'm looking at it right now on the map. And it looks like it's going to hit most of the Midwest and the southeast and the east. And for all you people that live in Pennsylvania, they are predicting some flooding because of the buildup of all of the ice on the rivers in Pennsylvania. Uh, Delaware, New Jersey, other places. So uh, the Susquehanna was completely filled with ice. Now this ice is going to kind of melt. When it melts, the 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 rise of the water will be uh, fairly substantial. So we'll be dealing with some flooding, and not just the uh, the low temperatures 
here's a forecast for later this week. Wednesday night, if you are living in the Northeast, it's going to be 33, 30 in New York, 9 degrees in Minneapolis, 24, uh, 17 degrees in Chicago, 29 in St. Louis. You know, these are not unusually cold temperatures. But unfortunately, they are being portrayed as being unusually cold. Isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting what they try to do with our attention and our minds? Weather and the planets, they're our enemies now. You can't trust the weather and you can't trust the planet. It is uh, 1245 here in Austin, Texas. Lovely Austin. I uh, wanted to uh, just read a few more stories here. What else can I read for you today as we get into this a little bit? Uh, there were eight H1N1 flu deaths last week in the Bay Area. Uh, there was a woman in Ohio who died of H1N1, and she had gotten the flu shot. Now, I have a Facebook friend. God bless her. She's an astrologer. I think she's a nice person, but I think she's absolutely abysmally wrong. And she said that 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 the people that think that the the flu vaccine actually gives you the flu are wrong, and it's the flu vaccine that is helping people stay alive. Can somebody please tell me when the fuck flus became killer, when they became deadly? When did that happen? Because the flu would used to be just a flu. You would have it for a couple of days, you would sweat, and you'd be over it. And then all of a sudden, the flu shot came. Get the flu shot. Get the flu shot. And it wasn't just the flu anymore. It became some some other thing. It became H1N1 or what? What you know? The flu has become this like modern plague. I mean, it's, they have transmutated this thing into a version of the Spanish flu or whatever it is. And on some level, it has. Right? On some level, it's not just the flu. We're not just dealing with garden variety influenza. There's some other thing is happening now, and it is a pretty serious deal now if you get it, unfortunately. However, I don't think the flu shot is going to help you very much. And in fact, I think the flu shot will uh, make you sick. I've seen it. My mother gets the flu shot on a regular basis. She's always sick. Now, according to my friend, my Facebook friend, if she didn't get that flu shot, well, she'd die. I don't know. All I know is I'm not going to get a flu shot. Not at all. Nope. Nope. No way. Not now. Never. However, somebody from Obamacare might come along and knock on my office, like my door. Hello there. We're with uh, the Affordable Care Act, and our records show that you've not received a flu vaccine in the last three years. And unfortunately, we're going to have to catch you up and give you a flu vaccine, a flu shot, for every three years that you miss the flu shot. And if you don't let us in, uh, I have a representative here with the Internal Revenue Service who uh, is uh, carrying a shotgun, and we will let ourselves in. Will it happen? I don't know. Uh, I was I was asked, how do we get out of Obamacare inside the chat room today? And I don't know. I don't have an answer for you, boys and girls. Believe it or not, I don't. I don't. I don't have an answer. I think the only way that we can uh, somehow manage this is to repeal it. And the only way that it can get repealed is if during the midterms, which are coming up this year, that somehow the people who voted for Obamacare and or support Obamacare get flushed out. Now, that could potentially happen, potentially. 
although we all know that the game is rigged with elections anyway, so it does, doesn't really matter. However, however, and if I were running, if, if I wanted to stage a coup through the midterm elections, I would take and run a program where the most uh, outside person, the most outside person running for every single office got the majority of the votes. When I say outside, it could be anybody. The UFO party, you know, Satan's for, demo- Satan's for democracy, whatever. Vote for those people. Vote for those people. But the only way I think we can, we can do this is if it gets repealed. The only way it gets repealed is if those people get replaced. And the only way they get replaced is with the midterms. Now, the midterms, and I've said this now for about a year and a half, are there? It's it's a big, it's a it's like a magic online these midterms. Now they could rig everything, and everybody gets reelected, or if they step down, some you know agreed upon and reasonable uh, replacement has been chosen, and then it takes up that space. But let's just say perhaps, perhaps, um, there is some true chaos and some other people getting elected who weren't supposed to get elected. That poses a problem for the system. Does the system, does the system want that problem to potentially exist? Does it? Do they want to allow the midterms to occur so that potentially the frontline soldiers who've supported everything, whether they're on the right or the left, get, get moved out. I don't think they do. So I think that the midterms are critical and that what happens between now and the midterms is critical as well. We'll have to see what happens. We'll have to see how this unfolds. And, and I think that there could be a fair amount of chaos happening before the midterm elections, for whatever reason. Whatever reason. Because I think the midterms might, and I put it in parentheses, might be the one opportunity that would allow us to somehow flush the system and get people in there who would potentially repeal Obamacare. Now, it would be interesting because then it would still have to the – repeat, the repeal process, I think, could be, could be put into court for quite a long time, which may or may not be a bad thing because it would slow down what would happen in the, uh, the advancement of Obamacare. Oh, boy, we have a lot on our plates, don't we? And I, and I don't think ignoring it is going to help. I don't think that there's there's some kind of you know new age solipsistic strategy that is going to be worthwhile. I know. I know. I don't think ignoring the problem is going to make the problem go away. And a lot of new age people don't want to hear that. A lot of new age people think it's negative, it's hateful, it's angry. All we have to do is focus on the positive, 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 positive. I, I, look, I agree positive is better than negative. Don't get me wrong. But to immediately put criticism or having some kind of oversight around an issue and to me put it in the negative and hateful bucket uh, is a, a brilliant strategy on the part of people that want to have, that want to control your mind. Absolutely, Cre- create that, create the hateful and negative strategy, so people just don't want to deal with things. You're bringing me down, man. All I want to do is be positive. Well, the great Sufi once said, "Tend to your camel first, and then trust in God." And unfortunately, we have not tended to our camels. And people are waking up. They're waking up. I'm sorry, people are waking up. People say that uh, they don't think that the the, uh, 
they don't think that the people on the right and the left are waking up fast enough. Well, that may or may not be the case. But they're waking up. The challenge here is, you know, do we have enough time? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And we have a lot more challenges ahead of us. It's not just Obamacare. We've got the TPP. We got a whole bunch of stuff. A lot more. All right, I think that does it for today. I don't want to leave you on a downer. I don't. I have to leave you with something up. What can I leave you with? Um, let's see. All right. I'll I'll share well, should I share this with you? Nah, it's too private. It's a private thing. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this though. Uh, I did. I did sign up to be my son's little league manager again for whatever team we're on. I signed up for it again, so I will take another shot at managing a little league team. This time it's going to be all ten year olds, and it's a spring season, and um, it's going to be much more competitive than the fall fall ball season where you know people were learning how to play the game. And there's a whole different set of codes. That go along with the spring. So this is, we're playing with, uh, before I was playing with house money, this time I'm playing with my own money. So it'll be really interesting, and I'm actually looking forward to it. It's uh, one of the things that helps keep me grounded and sane in a world that is uh, that is not always as grounded and sane as we'd all like it to be. All right, until then, let's see, so until Wednesday, when I'll be back, we'll be talking about astrology on Wednesday, we haven't had an astrology show for a while, right? So I'll be back on Wednesday talking about astrology. And I think I'll have a new uh, post up on the website. I've got some predictions for 2014. I'll lay those out. And um, so we'll have that. And then Friday, we'll have a guest, TBD. So we're back up to, to schedule here. We're ramped up. And, uh, again, you can find more of what I do over at Guy TV. And you can also, if you listen to this broadcast, want to connect on Facebook, you can find me on Facebook. And a lot of the people that are in the chat room hang out on Facebook as well. It's a great group. But until Wednesday, until we reconvene here for Navigating the Astrological Matrix, use your head and discern what's real. Your heart to stay open to what's possible. Uh, I'm Robert Phoenix. I'm your host. You're you. And here's Philip. We are living in a computer programmed reality and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed and some alteration in our reality occurs. We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present deja vu, perhaps in precisely the same way, hearing the same words, saying the same words, I submit that these impressions are valid and significant, and I will even say this, such an impression is a clue that at some past time point, a variable was changed, reprogrammed as it were, and that because of this, an alternative world branched off.